This week we are on the run from coast to coast. We start in Portland, Oregon to catch up with two of the fastest women in America, Shalane Flanagan and Kara Goucher. Then we're back in New York City to meet another fast young woman, Chinatown's own Zi Hong. NBC Olympic producer Joe Battaglia will join us once again to talk about the state of the sport, all in this episode of On the Run. It was only a couple of years ago when Shalane Flanagan and Kara Goucher were locked in a fierce rivalry. But all of that changed last year when they found themselves part of the same training group, and the fiercest of rivals became the best of friends. My name is Kara Goucher. I'm a two-time Olympian and a world championship bronze medalist. My name is Shalane Flanagan. I am a 2008 Olympic bronze medalist in the 10,000 meters. My first memory of Kara was actually in college, and it was my first NCAA cross country race. And I figure, you know what, that's the girl that's going to win the race. I'm going to just latch on to her. I first really remember Shalane actually from 2004, from the Olympic trials, because she was this little collegiate athlete um, competing with all the big girls. And she pretty much led the entire final, and I thought she was pretty tough. Once we got to the professional level, we were running the same events and, you know, had the same goals. We both wanted to win national titles, um, want to win medals um, on a world stage. So the rivalry became pretty, I'd say, pretty fierce. She's the best. She's the best U.S. athlete there is. And so, of course I want to beat the best. Like, who doesn't want to beat the best? About a year ago, Jerry came to me with the idea that Kara was interested in joining our group. And I, I was kind of shocked. You know, I'd had years of thinking of, of her as a rival and as someone I want to beat. I would literally think about Shalane while I was working out. You know, like, I would think about beating her. And then I was going to go and train with her and spend all this time with her and, and trust her. I just didn't know if it would really work out. So to switch over to bringing her into my inner circle and my comfort zone, um, initially just felt very strange. Once I kind of got over the fact that, yes, she was my rival, well, now, you know, we're gonna work towards these common goals that we have and really crush some people on the world scene. I was actually shocked um, at how close we became. I did not expect to get such a great friend out of, out of Shalane, and, you know, it kind of blew my mind. I remember telling my family, I, I really like her. She comes to practice talking about Colton. I'm like, well, listen to what my cat did today, you know, so. <laughs> her cat, Boo, she loves Boo. I don't have a kid to like brag about, so I'm like, well, Boo did this today. This is really cool. <laughs> I think there are people in your life that are just really important in relationships that you have. For me, obviously, my family, my husband, my son. And, you know, on that list becomes Shalane and my, my partnership with her because I dream with her and I joke with her, but she, it so, means so much to me. Seriously, she has rejuvenated my love for the sport. I believe Kara and I have some, some big moments ahead of us. I think ultimately we both feel that one of us is going to win a major marathon in the next couple years, if not the next couple months. We'll see their teamwork in action when they race shoulder to shoulder at the Dash to the Finish Line 5K on November 3rd here in New York part of the ING New York City Marathon celebration. Imagine finding yourself in a country where you don't speak the language and you don't have a single friend. It's a frightening prospect and one that Zi Hong knows all too well. <laughs> My name 
was see how and I was in fourth grade. I was ten year old. I was from China. When I was seven or eight year old, I moved to America. It's kind of hard because I don't know anyone in this speak language. That I cannot know what they're talking about. In most cases, when kids come in as immigrants, they don't actually want to be here, and you can't blame them because. They've been plucked out of a world they knew and grew up in and put into a new world, new culture, new language, no way of communicating, no way of understanding what's going on. I can't even imagine what they go through. Worried and nervous because all the things that they're learning I didn't really know and if they talked to me I didn't know how to answer. We are a school that's 80% ESL. So the first language is not English. I don't want to fail a child because of language, because they do have something. They do have this body of knowledge that I can't get to because of this language barrier. The programs will help me break through that barrier. The running program from New York Roadrunners is certainly one of those programs. At first, I didn't really know what. What it was mostly about, but then my friend told me that it was very fun, so I came and joined the running club. Running is definitely universal for them to be on a team and to feel part of a community. So I think that definitely helps kids who are new immigrants here. Zihang is a fourth grade student, and she was a shy child when she first started here in first grade. And I think that now being on a team has really helped her. Running can make me have make new friends because now I know how what are they talking about and I can answer. She wants to try to get her other friends who might be shy or who might be a little quiet to join running club too because I think that through running she, it's helped her develop more of her personality and show more of who she is. She is really part of this team now, and she's exactly the example that we want to show at PS One. We're joined once again by Joe Battaglia, a producer for NBC's Olympics. The topic for today, pacers versus racers. The merits of championship style racing versus racers that allow pacers. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Thanks for having me again. So let's talk about the races, particularly marathons, that do right. allow pacers versus don't. Right, well within the world marathon majors, there's, there's three, racers, three races that allow pacing. Chicago, Berlin, and London. The championship courses are Boston and New York and in the years of the World Championships and the Olympics when those are, are, are part of the scoring. So this is a very contentious issue. Yes. Where do you stand? Uh, I don't think pacers belong in the sport of track and field on any level, on the track, on the roads. I think it, uh, it just takes away from the sense of competition. You know, when, when you start bringing in pacers and you know, uh, you know, the emphasis becomes the time and you're running against the clock and the competition doesn't really matter. So I, I think it should, pacing should be eradicated from the sport altogether. But what do you say about races that are paced, like the Chicago Marathon in 2010 comes to mind, where you had pacers, but you still had one of the most spectacular finishes in the history of marathoning? Right. Still a spectacular race. Right. So what's your answer to that? Um, that race you know, sort of became less about time you know, as, as it evolved. The pacers were gone. And then you started getting, you know, a good mano a mano. Um, the majority of, of paced marathons, do they really, you know, play out like that? I think that's maybe the exception to the rule. Should it be more about the strategy, the finesse of the yeah. race? Yeah. I mean, when when you have a race like, you know, the Berlin Marathon, where Patrick McCow broke Haile Geber Selassie's world record, if you watch that race, Haile and, and, and Patrick were surrounded by six pacers in V formation like a flock of you know, ducks you know, migrating. It was literally V pattern. Well, let's uh, talk about that flock of five. Mm -hmm. As a viewer, as a fan, it can be super confusing. Yeah. You know, when you're looking at the TV screen and there's six runners on the screen, five of them are pacers, sometimes they're dressed differently, sometimes they're not. Right. Do you think it makes it a harder experience for the fan or harder to get fans into the sport? I think so. In a, televised pace marathon, you don't need to tune in until you know, an hour in because then everybody's past the halfway point, pacers are starting to drop off, and then that's when the action picks up. So 
uh, I think it's, it's detrimental um, you know, from a viewing standpoint and a, a broadcasting standpoint. It's certainly a hot button issue and something that people have very strong opinions about. For my part, I love watching races like New York and the Olympics where it's a real race, where people are mentally challenging themselves and challenging each other. But I can see the merits of Pacers as well because they do help the sport get faster. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. For more of Kara's story, tune into the On The Run radio podcast at nyrr.org, where you can also watch all of tonight's segments and past On The Run episodes. Join us next week when we travel to E10 Kenya to catch up with women's marathon world champion Edna Kiplagat. From the Armory in New York City, I'm Carla Bruning, and we'll see you on the run.